What's up guys? Today we're going to talk about Huntington's disease. So this is an update from the last video, just added a couple more things to make sure it's more clear and concise on some of the terminology that we're going to talk about. So let's talk about Huntington's disease in general with the anatomy. And so the anatomy that's associated with Huntington's disease is the basal ganglia. So the basal ganglia is a collection of nuclei that are all located at the bottom of the brain. It's a bunch of gray matter. And so essentially what it is during with Huntington's disease is again, the basal ganglia ganglia, if you're thinking that, you're like, wait, is that involved in another condition? Yes, it's involved in Parkinson's disease. However, with Huntington's disease, um, it's going to be atrophy of the basal ganglia, specifically the striatum. And so if we want to get specific about it, um, the striatum is degenerating. And in this area, there is basically a signal pathway that tells the body, hey, let's not do everything all the time. And so by everything, I mean large amplitude or small amplitude, jerky movements, whatever is going on with the patient. The basal ganglia, this section of it that's atrophying is basically the section that tells the, the body, hey, maybe don't like throw your arms around all the time. Maybe there's some times where we shouldn't do stuff. So therefore, because this is atrophying, that pathway doesn't work anymore. And the only thing that's left is just ah, moving around like crazy. And so that's why you see those chorionic movements with the patient, the athetosis, the excessive jerky movements with this patient. And so that's what's going on because that part of the brain is atrophying. So if you that was a little confusing, basically all you need to know, basal ganglia is affected, basal ganglia is shrinking. Therefore, we're having problems with motor control because this is responsible for voluntary motor control. This is a CNS pathology, so this is an upper motor neuron pathology, and it will also affect parts of the cerebral cortex in the sense of like the cortex communicating with the basal ganglia. So remember, the primary motor cortex will say, I'm going to do something. Basal ganglia is going to say, okay, voluntary muscle action, let's go. Then the cerebellum makes that voluntary action smooth. So that's kind of how everything comes together. So with the etiology of Huntington's disease, it is a autosomal dominant inheritance, which is found on chromosome four. So it's a faulty gene on chromosome four. The specific gene is the IT15 gene. And so therefore, what we're seeing with this patient is they're having... Um, this passed down to their children via autosomal dominance uh, pattern of inheritance, which means you only need one copy of the gene in order to express the condition. So if your dad had Huntington's disease and he gave you the Huntington's disease gene, it doesn't matter what your mom gave you, you're screwed. Like that's pretty much how this works. So a lot of people don't even realize they have this condition until they're between the ages of 35 and 55. And at that point, Many of these individuals, if they wanted to have children, have already had children. So therefore, they have already unknowingly passed this on to their offspring, um, which then causes some concern within the family of like if somebody else is going to inherit the gene. So um, that's kind of the pattern of inheritance, which I would say is important to know for the boards because there's other different conditions that have inheritance patterns. So just make sure you don't get that confused. So what does it look like? So again... The individual is usually between 35 to 55 years old, presenting with this new onset. So if you're seeing somebody in the new onset kind of phase, that's around where their age is. And this is important to understand anytime the boards ask demographic information of like, if it's more common in males, females, children, adults, age groups, like just know that demographic information is important and um, it's there for a reason. So it will present with something called Huntington's chorea, which is uh, caused by inhibition of the basal ganglia, which causes motor dysfunction. Um, so essentially what happens is that pathway that I was telling you that tells the body, hey, maybe we shouldn't throw our arms around like crazy all the time that pathway is not working. So therefore, the basal ganglia only knows how to go. And so it just goes wee all the time. And so that's how you see all of these uh, mo movements and disorders associated with Huntington's disease that involve lots of um, movements. So we see choreoathetoid movements. So I would definitely make sure you understand that word. So chorea is could be large or small jerking kind of movements. Um, so they could be larger amplitude, they could be smaller amplitude, and they're going to be random involuntary movements. So just understand that chorea is essentially a type of movement pattern that results in just random movements that are not controlled and they're not purposeful. That's a more important thing. It's moving without a purpose. It just is. Um, so this should not be confused with something called hemibolism. 
So hemibolism, these are violent large amplitude movements. But again, anybody with Huntington's disease, you should still be careful of the patient presenting with like, you know, the, the chorea because it's random, they can't control it. They still could cause like hurt themselves or hurt you. So take caution. But when it's a hemibolism, this is a different condition. So just kind of letting you guys know if it's a hemibolism, those are violent movements. So that's one that definitely from a safety perspective, you need to be more aware of. But again, still safety issues with this patient with Huntington's disease. Their random movements could hurt you and could also hurt them. So it's just making sure you're aware of that. Athetosis, so athetoid movements, that's going to be the snake-like writhing movements. So essentially, this patient is just, we see my square in the corner, they're kind of all over the place. Could be bigger movements, could be smaller, um, could be a jerk at some point. Again, could cause problems, not to the violent extent of hemibolism, but still definitely concern for the patient. So obviously you're going to see this going to affect their balance, going to affect their strength, their function, their ability to, you know, navigate their environment, manipulate objects. And so the patient also will have involuntary movements of the face, such as grimacing, sticking their tongue out, elevating their eyebrows, all of those sort of things, because those are facial skeletal muscles. They are affected by the basal ganglia controlling them. So again, we're seeing, um, different things with this patient because you need your muscles like your skeletal muscles to contract and make you know shapes for your mouth when you're speaking because they're lacking that control of making shapes with their mouth and those muscle movements the patient will present with problems of being difficult to understand and the patient could also as their you know their basal ganglia atrophies other parts of their brain could also start to atrophy so you're starting to see some other dementia and cognitive impairments present with the patient as they progress into the later stages so not even just their movement is a safety problem their judgment and emotional liability kind of becomes a problem as well uh, in the final stages the patient eventually becomes rigid and will need 24 7 care because they are unable to completely take care of themselves and again, the patient will usually pass away between 15 to 20 years after the onset of symptoms. This is a very slow and painful disease to watch your loved one go through. And it's very unfortunate for families because then they know that somebody, you know, might have got the gene as they uh, like a child and then they're going to go through all this over again. Uh, so, again, just make sure that you're kind of aware of the severity of the situation. It's very rare, um, but just understanding what's going on with it. So how are we treating it? Patient and caregiver education is number one. So um, patient might, you know, have just been diagnosed and they're like, do I need a wheelchair now? No, like you're, you can still walk and everything. You're not at the point where you would need a wheelchair for safety. Um, we just got to be careful with the, the patient uh, because they... They might be on some like anticonvulsant medications to avoid those excessive movements. So kind of the same way a seizure has random movements, this has been random movements. Um, so they're really trying to manage the patient medically with that. Uh, PT will pro focus on maximizing the patient's current level of function. So working on strength and transfers, balance, ambulation, postural control, and functional mobility, stretching to prevent contractures. So all of that stuff is very important, basically making sure the patient can remain as independent as long as possible and as safely as possible. Um, and then as for uh, adaptive equipment, I kind of mentioned earlier, eventually the patient will start needing adaptive equipment and the family will need to make discussion, have discussions and make decisions about end of life care. So uh, yeah, it's a very slow condition and it's kind of all hands on deck when it comes to making sure the patient's taken care of. So keywords that I want to talk about is going to be basal ganglia, of course, that's where the problem is, autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance on chromosome four. Chromosome four. If you see chorea, chorea athetoid, athetosis, all those words are going to be very closely associated with Huntington's. Uh, again, individuals who are between the ages of 35 to 55 years old are going to be the primary group of people that's affected by this disease. And then patient caregiver family education will be number one priority to make sure everybody's on the same page and safe. Uh, because this is an unpredictable disease and then terminal disease, it will end the patient's life 15 to 20 years after their diagnosis or when they start first presenting symptoms. So keeping that in mind, um, and working with anybody with a terminal illness, you kind of got to tread carefully with how you talk about things. And then our sample question, a physical therapist assistant is treating a patient diagnosed with Huntington's disease. The patient is still able to transfer independently and ambulates with a slight ataxic gait, but is becoming more and more worried about falling over. The patient lives with her child and daughter-in-law. 
What is the most important intervention to complete with the patient at this time? One, work on balance training and transfers. Two, discuss with patient and caregiver about fitting patient for an assistive device. Three, teach the patient how to get up from the ground if they do fall. Or four, teach the family member how to guard the patient while they transfer. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that one. All right, so the answer is going to be discussed with the patient and caregiver about fitting the patient for an assisted device. And so this is basically saying, hey, the patient is still independent with their transfers. They have a slight ataxic gait, and their main worry is that they are worried about falling over. That is the main thing they're worried about. When they're walking, they're worried about falling over. So again, working on balance and transfer training, yes, absolutely would work on that. This is asking what's the most important intervention. Remember, involving the patient and their caregivers in the conversation is going to be the biggest you know, bang for your buck. So again, at this point, the patient's probably needing an assistive device. Um, and so we want to make sure they know how to use it fitting them for it, and then making sure everybody's on the same page. So that's why number two is the answer, even though I think a lot of these are really good answers. Um, teaching the patient how to get up from the ground if they do fall. Yeah, I think you should be teaching tra floor transfers with every patient who is possibly a fall risk, because if they do end up on the ground, do they know how to get up, especially if they didn't end up hurting themselves or something like that? Do they know how to get back up? Because the last thing you want is your patient's stuck on the ground. However, I think it, of the tier of importance of interventions is preventing the patient from falling in the first place. That's probably number one priority. Uh, so doing all those preventative things first and then, you know, teaching those retroactive. If they do fall, this is what you do sort of thing. Um, four, teaching a family member how to guard the patient while they transfer. In the question, it says that they're still independent with transfers. Um, so they're more worried about their ambulation falling. So at this question, like if this answer said, teach the family member how to guard the patient while they ambulate. I would say that that's probably very close to being number one answer. So we have four really good answers here, but the most important intervention is let's get them something to avoid falling and let's involve everybody who's involved with this patient, all hands on deck. So that kind of hits all the big major points. But if you got this one wrong, don't feel bad. Um, it's a pretty tough question. Uh, probably one of the toughest questions that I even have ever wrote. Um, so yeah, and if you guys have any questions, let me know, but that's Huntington's disease. Uh, definitely probably going to show up on the board, so know that terminology. All right, guys, I'll see you on the next one. Take care. Bye, guys.